there. And of course, it's an easy car to spot from behind that bright red, bright yellow car. You would like to pass it to James. There was a time not too many years ago when you wouldn't have seen a wife anywhere near the pit area here at Indianapolis, but time sure has changed. Learn from your chaps, I believe, in Grand Prix. Well, you know, Americans have some strange customs. You weren't allowing ladies in the pits. We've always attracted ladies to our racing. <laughs> Indianapolis. Back in 1913, a Frenchman, Jules Gou, drank champagne on every pit stop and won the race and credited it to the champagne. Absolutely, certainly. <laughs> well, you saw the signal to Johnny Rutherford to come in for fuel. Fuel, a critical situation here. They just get 1.8 miles per gallon. It is not gasoline. It's basically alcohol. Yes, and if he has a very good pit stop, he could come in there and take about... 38 or 39 gallons of fuel, and there's Mario Andretti, he's going down. He's on the inside of the racetrack, this is not under a yellow, this is not going into the pit. This is a serious blow for Mario Andretti, it looks like he switched off the engine, he's sitting there, there must be going through his mind, not another mechanical failure. The yellow light is not out, they're still racing, you can see the yellow car there, car number four is Johnny Rutherford, the Chaparral still going, and all eight cylinders in the Ford Cosworth engine, he's not going down, but Mario Andretti, I fear, may well be out of the race because he was going very slowly indeed. Time after time, not only in Grand Prix in the last year or so, but two the years here at Indianapolis, mechanical problems, often a very small part, there he is down low on the race course, has sidelined Mario Andretti. Again, there he is by the white line, creeping in towards the pit. Almost unquestionably, he'll be out of the Indianapolis 500. He's certainly not going to win it. Now they do bring the yellow out. So again, they are slowing down, racing under the yellow at Indianapolis. Sam Posey, a fine race driver himself, who will be driving tomorrow at Lime Rock, is down with Al Unser in the garage area. I'm with Al Unser, a three-time winner in the Indianapolis 500. But Al, it's not going to be a fourth time today. What happened? Uh, something happened in the engine, Sam. It, uh dropped a valve or something i really don't know it only started running on seven cylinders so that was all until then how is it going not very well i wasn't happy at all i uh the car's not working well it's not with the 48 inches uh it, it's ridiculous if they're going to race like this and i'm telling you guys are doing stuff out there that are plumb out of reasoning and, and stupid because uh they're trying to run them so hard because of the low horsepower. It's, it's, it's pathetic. Does this mean a lot of dangerous attempts to overtake in the short shoot, stuff like that? Look how many crashes they've already had. Yeah. It's very dangerous out there. If you back off just a little bit, somebody almost hits you. It's, it's past the, the stage of being safe. Al, a thought that has to go through your mind now, the ride that you vacated, Johnny Rutherford, he's leading the race. Uh, how do you feel? No. Yeah. No different than I felt last year. Uh, I don't know what to say. I, I left him, and I'm not sorry I left him. Well, we certainly wish you better luck in the rest of the races this year. Al Unser was referring to the fact that he left the team that Johnny Rutherford is now driving for. But Mario Andretti up out of the car. That's it for the race. What a tough break. Mario Andretti out of it. Johnny Rutherford the leader. And more to come. according to plan uh, we had our good stops and uh, we were just getting organized on our tire set so I think the game plan was just going very smoothly for us and then of course this happened and now Mario we've had a lot of accidents uh, do you have any reason why well you know cornering speeds are up and uh, that's all you can really attribute it to but uh, luckily you know I'm knocking on wood uh, everything looks pretty good and nobody's injured so. how do the rookies look to you I've got no particular problem uh, really in traffic. I think everybody was pretty heads up. Okay, thanks very much. Mario Andretti, 1969 winner. Out of it again. Okay, that was Chris Economaki with Mario. And look at this. Again, shuffling in the standings because of...
the pit stops under the yellow, but the leader is the man who started in last place in this race, Tom Smita, who twice has been second here, who twice sat on the pole when he was with Roger Penske. He was dismissed by Penske with a new team now, and this is an unbelievable driving performance. It definitely is, and look at the race there for second and third position. Bobby Young from the right-hand side of your car, the dark color, the number 11, and Johnny Rutherford, Bernie Laporte, for him. <laughs> so, Tom Steve out in front, Rutherford second, and Bobby Unser third. A very interesting afternoon so far. We've had so many cars involved in the fight for the lead. And good racing, really good, strong motor racing. It hasn't been any pushy shooting by anyone. No. Very happy for Tom Steve. There you are, number one for Tom Steve. through the cockpit with him still in it I had to spin to miss him and I was headed in a line that I should have missed him and by the time I got there he was already there uh, he bounced off the outside wall and come back down across the track and uh, you know I spun to miss him and hit the inside wall that's about all I can say I think there's too much emphasis put on uh, the rookies because we're as good as they are we wouldn't be here now that veteran you spoke of I believe was Jim McElroy who'll be the oldest driver in the field indeed a veteran of 15500 you seem to have a little edge on the uh, on, on the way you said that, uh, Roger, was it kind of building up this week with all the pressure on the rookies? Well, they've given us a lot of flack, and uh, everybody looks at you like you shouldn't be here, but, uh, you know, I've driven eight different championship cars, and this is only my first 500 here, but it's not my first 500, and, uh, you know, they're not speaking of just me, I'm sure, but a lot of the other rookies, and, uh, you know, uh, these guys are evidently professionals, or they wouldn't be here. Uh, that's what it amounts to, and uh, I'm just, it's just sad that it's uh, the situation the way it is where everybody has to come in and buy rides if they hired everybody on their ability definitely there's some rookies that wouldn't be here i know one thing you won't be a rookie next year that's for sure back to you jim let's have another look now at don whittington's problem jackie well he got high on the racetrack there it seems certain that he had a tire problem because you can see that yellow car coming out of turn four there suddenly the car gets very loose indeed the car spins and look it doesn't make contact with the wall he keeps correcting the steering there you can see the steering working there but you can already see that the tire look how the tires are stopped there as he's sliding to a stop trying to slow the car down that front wheel stopped altogether and then he just misses the wall that was and that, that tire is flat right there it's so to understand the roger rager interview you must take it in the context that he represents the low budget racer here his engine started in a school bus that's an actual fact Yes, we're back at Indianapolis once again. 
And we'll be back after this word from our local stations. Back at Indianapolis again, Jim McKay with Jackie Stewart, and there are the standings. Bobby Unser, Tim Richmond, the rookie, Tom Sneva, Johnny Rutherford, and Rick Mears. Bobby Unser out in front with a good lead, but look at all this action going on behind there. Tim Richmond up high alongside Tom Sneva. Sneva down low now. And here comes Johnny Rutherford in car number four going past Richmond, so they both moved by the rookie. Boy, uh, Rutherford did it there with not a great deal of concern for good manners as Ooh. far as Richmond was concerned, but this is the racing business. This is not a day out for gentlemen friends, and he certainly wanted to get up there because, in fact, Bobby Unser has taken a very commanding lead after that yellow. It seems that he's perhaps anticipated the green flag slightly and certainly got the power on nice and early because look at the gap. That's it. That's the gap there, and here's the second group, Tom Sneva and Johnny Rutherford coming, so you can see how good a job Bobby did there at the start of that green flag. And here comes Rutherford again, moving past Tom Sneva in that great Jim Hall car, pride of Midland, Texas. The car is, Johnny's the pride of Fort Worth, Texas. Well, they're certainly proud Texas. No question of that. Bobby Unser still in the lead, and that lead substantial at the moment, meaning, well, about 100 yards, which, as you pointed out earlier, is one second on the race course. But it's interesting to see how quickly if, if, if Johnny Rutherford could catch him up, because it has been obvious all day long that his car has been the fastest car on the speedway, and any deficit that he's had, he's been able to make up. So therefore, it'll be interesting to see if he can catch Bobby, because he's out of his draft now, really. That's 185 mile an hour lap for Bobby Unser, which is no slow speed around this speedway. Is there such a thing at 185 miles an hour as subtle actions like teaching a rookie that you're in charge, that you're the boss, that you're the guy with experience? Oh, no question about it. In fact, where Johnny Rutherford stuck his nose in going through turns two there to Tim Richmond, he was very well declaring the fact that he was the boss, that he was a two-time winner of this Indy 500. That now, attention, young man, move slightly to the right because I'm coming through. I am your superior and I have the credentials to be so. And I suspect Tim Richmond at age 24 understood that extremely well. So the race goes on at Indy. Well, we've got 89, 189 miles an hour for Johnny Rutherford. I think that is the fastest unofficial lap so far. And by so doing, he's closing up on Bobby Unser. Okay, we've talked a lot about Johnny Rutherford. Earlier, Chris Economaki had some words with this two-time winner of the great 500-mile race. Johnny Rutherford, 1963, crew cut, running around here looking for your first start in the Indy 500. How much has it changed over the years? Oh, Chris, it's tremendous. The, uh, the I mean, change. for you as a man. For me? Well, I'm, I'm uh, up on top now, Chris, where I wasn't then. I was a uh, bug-eyed rookie running around here uh, just in total awe of this place and the, and the magnitude of it and, and the uh, veteran drivers that... Uh, I'm on the track running as hard as I can go, and one of them goes by, and uh, like I'm painted on the fence, you know, and uh, and uh, now I'm one of the guys that goes by like they're painted on the fence, and it's it's you know it's fun and it's it's better now, uh, you know I enjoy it more because I'm one of the top racers and uh, uh, can uh, relate to uh, past experiences to help me go fast and be able to help the rookies to talk to them and tell them the things that I've learned here. John, Wally Dallenbach rides a motorcycle alone in the Colorado Rockies for relaxation. Bobby Unser goes up in the mountains to his ranch all alone. What is it about racing drivers who want to do things alone? Chris, I don't know. I guess through the ages that may be a question that's never answered to anyone's satisfaction. Uh, do you have a fear of making friends in racing and have them perhaps killed? No, I, I've never felt that way, and I've lost a lot of friends over the years uh, through racing accidents. But it's, uh, I think, you, you know, you're, you're by yourself in that race car uh, while you're racing. Uh, you do your, your best thinking sometimes in solitude, so I think that's probably the draw, is the, the fact that you can get away from it all uh, not have any distractions and think about the situation and work out some problems. John, 16 drivers who were in last year's race are on the outside looking in this year. What's it going to do to you 
the first 500 that you're not in? Well, I, uh, I don't know, Chris. I hate to even think about that. Uh, uh, right now, the position we're in uh, with the uh, Pennzoil Chaparral uh, and Jim Hall's team uh, you, you just, I can't fathom that. It's a situation where things are so good and we're so up right now that uh, you can't even uh, devote the time to that. So I'm, I'm, uh, I guess if that ever happened to me, I would probably hang it up and walk away. I got a tip for you, John. I don't have any retirement plans either. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Johnny Rutherford, who in talking about his career, that is he in second place behind Bobby Unser still, did not mention that in the 60s, for example, he broke both of his arms. There's his wife, Betty Rutherford, sitting up on top of the pits, keeping her own lap chart. So, the racing goes on. A couple of tough guys up front. Bobby Unser at age 46, Johnny Rutherford at age 42, the defender, Rick Mears, at age 28, is in third place. We'll be back at Indy. So Bobby Unser still leads at Indianapolis. As the race moves inexorably on. Nowhere near the finish yet, however. Long way to go, and it's a hot day, remember. A sunny day. And it looks like maybe Bobby is lengthening it a bit over Johnny Rutherford, Jackie. It certainly seems to have lost yep. a lot of time because when we left for our commercial there, he was much closer, Jim. He certainly has. Definitely lo losing a lot of ground out there in the race course. Bill Fleming is down by the Rutherford pit. Can you give us a report on that situation, Bill? You know, for the first time today, Johnny Rutherford is actually dropping back a little bit. So we asked them what has happened to the car, and they say it's pushing. Now, in driving parlance, that means that the car is just not cornering right. So I think the next time you come in, you're going to see what happens. He's going to change the right front and try to get a different combination of stagger on those tires. In other words, to try to get a little bit more balance built into the front end so it'll get around those corners quicker. We'll see what happens. Okay, Bill Fleming in the pits. Thanks very much. You can see Rutherford out there still dropping behind the leader, Bobby Unser. You know, he's in radio contact with the pits, and that's how Jim Hall knows that the front end is pushing. When the front end is pushing, it means that the driver is turning into that left-hand bend, and the car wants to go straight on out towards the wall, and the Bobby leader in the pits. Unser is coming into the pits. Now, let's watch this Penske teamwork here. Tremendously proficient. Looked over by Roger Penske himself. He's got his son in the pits today. And look at that team setting about the not changing rubber. Bobby Anson, look at the clock on the right hand side. And they've oh, come out. What is that? 6.8 seconds. That is impressive. He probably didn't take a full load of fuel off, but uh, he may have taken more than 30 gallons on. Takes longer than that for a guy to ask me how much I want in the gas station. Uh -huh. Well, this man certainly is in winning mood right now because he's, he's found himself in the lead. But look, he's always oh, high on the racetrack. Now, that could be the fact that he's pushing. And there's Sneva in the pitch right now. He had been running third, remember, Tom Sneva, who started in last place in this field. Yep, he's doing it. Now, let's have a look at how long it's taken him. He's got off in 12.2 seconds. A lot of fuel gets spilled in. He was a little slow in getting out the pit there. Didn't get it away as quickly. The clock stopped. Start as quickly as he could have done, but that's Johnny Rutherford. When we last saw him, he was heading high on the racetrack, almost out of the groove, because his car does seem to be ill handling, and he's coming into the pits. Okay, Rutherford coming into the pits now in car number four. Remember, these are all under the green. Uh, it was AJ Foyt was in his way there, I believe, momentarily. He was coming into the pits. He was going into his pit, which is further up the racetrack, and he was going a little slower naturally. So there is the car coming in. He's the clock is stopped. Perhaps a there the wheels hadn't come to an absolute stop johnny rutherford you can see man who like me seems to screw his eyes up a lot in bright sunshine it's a little bit slower he changed rear rubber there he changed the front rubber he's got out in 18 19.1 seconds they've probably made several adjustments to that car in that time johnny rutherford will be able to report to jim hall in the pits through his radio whether he's getting the car to grip that bit better but there's last year's winner rick Mears now in the lead okay all of these pit stops under the green again let's go down to bill fleming 
Jim, how was the pit stop as far as you saw? Well, it was uh, it was reasonable. We uh, put a lot of fuel in. It took 17 and a half seconds. Uh, we changed three tires, so it was a good pit stop for us. It wasn't a particularly quick one, but it was a good one. Jim, a little bit earlier, you'd made the motion that the car was pushing a little bit. We thought you might try to change the stagger somewhat. Yeah, we uh, we changed the tire setup for him, so it ought to be okay now. Okay. Goodbye. All right, and there is Rick Mears, the new leader, but he's coming down low. Let's see. Yeah, he's got a pit this time. Here he comes, Rick Mears, into the pit. All of the leaders pitting under the green when time is of the essence. Every half second counts. Not like under the yellow when you have a small luxury of time, let's say. And again, the pen stitch crew, but these are different wheel changes and different fueling people for each of those cars and an immense amount of competition within these crews to see who can get their man and their driver and they're very jealous of each other and getting them out in the fastest possible way a 12.2 second pit stop again a very good pit stop the Penske crew are good now all of the leaders have had their pit stops and Bobby Unser is once again back in the lead where he has been for a good portion of this motor race here at Indianapolis. Again, weather conditions perfect for the spectators. Temperature about 80 degrees, a warm sun. It's a nice summer day. But for these race cars, it's going to start taking its toll. Engine-wise, it certainly can. And oh. here we see Bobby Unser coming into the pits again and still under a green light. This is an unscheduled pit stop. It has to be. Appear, and he's certainly coming in again. This is a sad day for him because he has, in a way, been I mean, with him and Johnny Rutherford, they've dominated oh. the race. Nick Simon has lost a wheel. And, and he's gone down to the race. He's still in control of the race car. Nick Simon staying with it. You can look at parts are flying off. There's the wheel finally come to rest here. It looked like the front end of the car almost exploded. The car's rubbing heavily now on the road. The race car cannot possibly go back out in the track with the amount of damage that this will be doing. Let's look at it again. Look at the left hand side of our picture here. Now watch this. Almost exposed. Obviously a suspension failure. And this is the type of thing that wheel could have gone back, it could have hit the driver, it could have gone right over, bounced over even this tremendous safety fence that they have outside this racetrack. But he keeps his cool, he doesn't change direction sharply. He tries and keeps calm with the car, and that's what the driver has to do. Oh, we've got a fire in the pits here, Hurley, Hurley Haywood's car, but he's out of it. The driver, okay, no problem. All kinds of action going on. We'll reorganize and come back. With that fire out. With Chris Schenkel, this is Dave Diles. The yellow is still out because Dick Simon lost a, a wheel. Johnny Rutherford is still in the race. Let's check those who are not in the race. And the last time we were with you, there were 12 drivers who have uh, gone out of the race. And here they are again, Larry Cannon, Dick Ferguson, and Bill Whittington, the first two rookies in the field of 10 that are out. Spike Gelhazen, well, he was uh, not injured in his crash. Mike Mosley, a broken gasket. Tom Bagley out of the race in the 29th lap. And the list continues to grow with Al Unser, Johnny Parsons, whose father is driving the very busy pace car today, and a popular rookie, a little fire, in the, in the pits as they were refueling the car, Gordon Smiley, out in the 47th lap. Jim McElreath, the oldest driver. Roger Rager, another rookie. And there's veteran Jerry Carl that is out of the race. And then the man that uh, was in his 15th 500, Mario Andretti, one of the two foreign-born drivers in the race today. And you know, I think it's only fair to point out, Mario has tremendous fans all over the world, but it's only fair to point out that in 15 Indy 500s, he has only successfully negotiated the complete race twice. He's a little hard on equipment, and one of those races that he did successfully negotiate was rain abbreviated. And a very strong man, physical conditioning does count because he held his car in place after losing that wheel. We're talking about Dick Simon on the 58th lap. And uh, Don Huntington spun out, but he spun out on the fourth turn and was able to roll into the pits, so maybe he'll still be competitive. So now we have nine lead changes. We've had uh, nine yellow flags, uh, 42 minutes and 35 seconds under the yellow light, and that's something. And now half of the rookies are out of the race, half we, of the 10. We could have the slowest winning speed in a lot of years, Chris. I think the green flag is about to come out. So we take you back now to Jim McKay and Jackie Stewart to describe the action on the racetrack here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Okay, Dave and Chris, the yellow light goes out, the green flag is waved, and they're racing again. Johnny Rutherford is the leader. 
Rick Mears in that blue car ducking, ducking down low, taking over second place. In third place, we have Bobby Unser, number 11, then Tom Steven, number 9, Gordon Johncock, number 20, has moved into fifth place. He had led at one point in the race, remember, but there is Rutherford. He's got himself the lead again. Yep, he's certainly got it. And look at the lead he's taken out already. It's amazing. He just seems to be able to pull it out the bag. And, of course, when a driver's on form with a car that's handling well, he can do this sort of thing, and he tends to look as if he's dominating. But right now, there are three of best going down there. They're shuffling like a bunch of cars in Las Vegas going through there. That was Gordon Johncock and Gary Bettenhausen. Gary Bettenhausen started next to last, but he's moving up in the field now and is currently in sixth place. And we have Steve, in third place, who started dead last. Well, it's nice to see Gary Bettenhausen getting up and being competitive and being so highly placed here because he's such a nice person. He's had a lot of bad luck in the past. He's driven almost any kind of race car that he can sit in, but he's, he's got a rather bad right arm and he doesn't get a lot of use out of it, but he's certainly got a lot of talent that was injured in a race crash. Incidentally, A.J. Foyt is not running particularly well today. He's been well back in the pack for most of the race. The four, only four-time winner. Bobby Unser slowing down. There he is on the right of your screen. That looks bad because it's not the part of the racetrack. He's in the back stretch, 3,300 feet in length, and he's pulled right off the racetrack underneath the double yellow line there to stay away from the fast cars, which means that he's either switched the engine off or the engine is not going on all eight cylinders in a satisfactory fashion. speed he's now in the pit apron he's going towards the pits well we saw him make that unscheduled pit stop and whatever it is apparently has caught up with him once and for all bobby unser is not going to win the indianapolis 500 this year now another of the penske cars you know is out of the race mario andretti that leaves rick mears the defending champion upholding the penske forces all along well they may get this sorted out they're working on it they're certainly feverishly working on it they haven't just shaken their head and walked away neither has bobby unser got out the race car he can't be sure what it is it looks like they're going to try and take off the engine carling that's bad news that takes a lot of time so therefore you're looking at a man as you rightly say who's not likely to win the race they look as if they're working towards the ignition system but there's the man who's still leading this race in a convincing fashion a lot of disappointment in the sport of motor racing, and particularly when you have been leading in the greatest race of them all, the Indianapolis 500. Again, a crowd approaching 400,000 people have gathered on a bright, sunny summer day. There's Rick Mears, who is second. Okay, Bill Fleming is down near the Bobby Unser pit. Why don't we get down and get another report from Bill? Here we go. What you see there is the crew working feverishly on removing the coil on the engine of Bobby Unser's car. I feel for Bobby, his face is flushed, he's obviously frustrated. There's nothing worse than to have to sit there now while all this laborious work goes on. Who knows how long it'll take. Okay, well it certainly doesn't look like it's going to take a short time. Look at him wagging his head in uh, frustration. Uh, he's sitting there, he's a disappointed man. Uh, I know the feeling, I've read this race and I've had mechanical troubles and it ain't no good feeling. <laughs> well, and at age 46, he knows there can't be too many more Indianapolis 500s. But Johnny Rutherford at age 42 is doing nothing but looking forward because he is leading the race now at Indianapolis. Minus six, Rick Mears six seconds down to the leader, Rutherford, is what that means. Rick Mears, the defender, is in second place behind Rutherford. And there you see Sneva, John Cock, and Bettenhouse. We'll be back. Three hours of coverage on Indy this year, so there's a lot more to come. And we'll return after these words from your local station. Back at Indy again, Jim McKay in the commentary booth with Jackie Stewart. And remember, we still have more than an hour of coverage coming your way. Three hours of coverage this year, as opposed to two in the past. The leader, Johnny Rutherford, then Rick Mears, the, the defender. Tom Sneva, who started in last place and is now third. And John Cox, you saw there. So, but this is the man of the hour up to this point, at any rate. Rutherford, who bided his time when he had to sit behind Bobby Ooh. Oh, look out, that is Jerry Sneva. Place. 
This is his younger brother, and he, he gave the sign that he's okay. Jerry Steva in the car. Gee, right near turn two, that has not been kind to the Steva family. There's a look at Jerry in close-up, uh, because the terrible crash of brother Tom happened in turn two a few years ago, and this year, their younger brother, Jan, trying to qualify for the race, also crashed in two. Now here is Johnny Rutherford into the pits, and his car number four, the leader. And Tom had another crash or two in practice this year. to steer in to the skid but of course it has no effect remember he's doing more than 180 miles an hour the smoke again is tire smoke and now look at him hitting this wall the car almost hits it symmetrically with the two tires the car comes right back down on the road no fire again this is an impressive thing about indianapolis well it certainly is if you remember tom steve's crash when he crashed here a few years ago in turn two his car did catch on fire not so this time and there's a very specific reason for that really and it's because there are such things as fuel cells in these in these cars now it's been one of the major moves forward in safety they see the ambulance standing by but let's find out something about the fuel cell with chris economaki with speeds in the indianapolis 500 approaching the 200 mile an hour mark accidents can be disastrous if proper safety precautions are not taken the organizers of the event therefore are very safety conscious particularly in the area of fuel containment and fire prevention Every car has a specially constructed fuel cell made by Goodyear. It's an interesting piece of equipment. It's made of two layers of puncture-resistant nylon coated with natural rubber, much like the fuel bags in the Vietnam helicopters that were subjected to machine gun fire. On the outside are two layers of puncture-resistant nylon as a shroud to give it added strength. Let's take a look at how strong this really is. I want to give it a couple of licks with an ax here. I'm no Paul Bunyan, but I'm going to give it my best shot. Let's see what happens here. Well, we hardly put a crease in the outer nylon. As you can see, it's a very strong unit. Now, recently, our cameras visited the Goodyear facility in Akron, Ohio, where the units are put to a much more graphic test. The cell we're using in today's test is one to fit last year's cars, or the construction is the same. All the ones made for this year's race are already in their cars. They're raised in a rig 65 feet high. They're full of water. They weigh 280 pounds and they're dropped. And as you can see, when this fuel cell hits the ground, it does not burst. It's the equivalent of a 185 mile an hour wall crash here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's a graphic test of a fine new safety device. Now what's gonna happen to these? Well, I suspect someday you'll find them in the tank of your car in the family garage, but not until the $3,500 unit price comes down a little bit. Okay, a look at the fuel cell that was very instrumental here in this crash. And just look at the racetrack. There's no fuel on the racetrack. So therefore, that fuel tank did not burst. Okay, now there's Bobby Unter out of his car. Day is done for him. Let's go down to Bill. Well, I've got an ignition problem, and apparently it must be in the ignition itself. That's one part we can't change to get to. I know you changed the coil, but it didn't work. No, it didn't help us. That's the likely thing to go wrong with the coil, but it didn't help this time. And I can't imagine the frustration you must have felt sitting here for five minutes while that's going on behind you. Yeah, you just see a, you see a year's work just go down the drain. Of course, it isn't just me, it's the, the crew and the Norton people and Roger Pinsky. It's, um, you know, it's a year's work for us at this place. And you know, it's I only see. speculation now, Bobby, but, but you and, and Johnny Rutherford seem to be the fastest cars on the track. How, how do you think it would have turned out? Well, Johnny was going to be tough, and uh, but I think that he thought maybe I was going to be tough, too, so I don't know. I had a good hold on him, but uh, it seemed like maybe I couldn't let go of him too easy either. So. Maybe he's breathing a sigh of relief as he sees your car in the oh, side. He's just as happy as I would have been if it was him dropping out, but I, uh, I, 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 we just feel awfully bad. And I feel sorry for the crew. I think I do for myself, you know. You and Brother Al, wasn't your dad, was it? No, I guess not. You know, 
Bobby, while we have you here for just a moment, it seems we've had more attrition this year. More cars hitting the wall or spinning or going out. Is there any reason for that? We have less than half the field, I think, now. Well, I didn't really didn't think it was going to be that bad. I, I really haven't surveyed who's done all the wrecking so far, but I bet part of us, uh, maybe some of it's going to be to the rookies, not all of it. And maybe some of it just to... Uh, not very much power, not very much wings in the car. I suppose probably a little bit. Now, of it. now you don't know this, but Al Unser did an interview with us a little bit earlier, and and he was quite disgruntled. I mean, he said, "Look, at the cars don't have the power. You, you can't race out there." I mean, he was really ticked off. Well, I don't blame him. Uh, see what they, what happened is when they changed the rules, they just went too far, and they got involved in the car just act war. So that particular rule, and it's too bad that it had to because I. The fans want to see a little bit faster racing. You want to see more boost next year. Yeah, we want to see a little bit faster racing, which, which ultimately means more boost. And I think we owe it to the fans. Uh, to the drivers, I, I drive just as hard now, or maybe harder. So there's really no difference in the driving. It's really a matter of uh, putting a show on for the people, I think. Okay, Bobby, we'll look for you next year. Well, I'll say hello to all the folks in New Mexico. Today. Thank you. Back to you, Jim. Penske Park cars meticulously prepared. Their drivers are an all-star team, and yet only one is left now. Something about the best laid plans of mice and men. I'm with Jerry Steve, who's just come in after an accident. Jerry, what happened? Oh, it's that uh, the car just got extremely loose, and we spun going into one and uh, hit the outside fence. Was it a hard impact? It hit harder than I wanted it to hit. <laughs> and but you're okay. Yeah, we're fine. Everything's good. Just uh, disappointed that we're out of the race. Okay, the pace of the race. Now, you were a rookie here three years ago. You've been kind of out of luck ever since. How did it seem to be going to you? Uh, it seemed like nobody was really running away too far. We were running just about, I think we were running about the same speed everybody was. And, and uh, you didn't have to pass. It was really uh, extremely hard to pass other cars. And uh, so there wasn't a whole lot of passing going on because everybody's running pretty close. If you did get an opportunity, uh, you needed to take advantage of it. So uh, the competition's pretty close. How about your brother? He started absolutely last in 33rd place, and he led the race. What do you think? That's me. I'm glad for him. That's a good job. Yeah, he's done a super job, and they've been very fast there in the pits. Listen, good luck to you. I'm sorry to see you here and not out there. Well, we are, too. Thank you, Sam. With Jerry Steven. Brother Tom not only led the race, he leads the race right now. The man who started dead last. Second place, Johnny Rutherford. Then the defender, Rick Mears. going on out there. Yep, there's the man there, Johnny Rutherford, who I must say that uh, I just like the look of that race car. Jim Hall, great innovator in motor racing, aerodynamics and so forth. Funnily enough, he might not have been the first man who brought aerodynamics to the speedway. That might have been Joe Concanon way back in 1961. He was a great innovator also. Jim Hall is the man who's given a lot of credit for aerodynamics, but Concanon certainly seems to be the man who brought it here. And Rutherford is charging again. Yes, Concanon had little Vestigial wings, little tiny ones on the back, didn't he? Yeah, inside the uh, race car, inside the, the left-hand side of the car, in fact. I've seen some pictures of them, and very small, but they've come a long way. Look at the size of the wings they have now. And there is Johnny Rutherford moving in pursuit of Tom Steva. Let's get out of Chris Mackey. He is with the wife of Johnny Rutherford, Betty. Okay, Chris. All right, Betty, how's he doing? Everything's going just as we plan, and if it co continues, it'll be really nice at the end. How many more pit stops? One more. One more, okay. John and Rutherford's wife, Betty, working on the stand here. Confident woman. She's been here many times before. And there's what she's watching. Her husband, John, closing in on Tom Steva for the lead in the Indianapolis Five. Oh, look at that. Gosh, she nearly hit the wall. And Johnny Rutherford there was right behind him. If he had hit the wall, Rutherford would have been involved in that. Now Rutherford says, I've had enough of that. I'm getting out. I'm going to get past. And nobody's going to crash in front of me. <laughs> Boy, Steva was really pushing that car. He's very, very close to the wall. But I've been watching him. He, in fact, drives very close to the wall. And this is a driver who's confident. Let's look at it again. Look how close it is. Coming out there. Coming out of turn four. Look at it. He almost creams the wall there. Johnny Rutherford recognizes it. Look how far Rutherford's away from the wall. He must have seen it coming maybe 50 yards before. Now there's a yellow flag out. It seems there might be some rubbish or debris on there's the race. There's no, been no accident or anything. It must be just some debris that they've spotted somewhere on the track. But the yellow comes out yet again. We've sure had plenty of them this afternoon here at Indianapolis. 
of course, if there is anything on the racetrack, the officials want to bring it in because a car could run over it and, of course, burst a tyre and cause a, a terrible accident. So Johnny Rutherford is still in the lead, and there is, there is Tom Sneva in the pits for a pit stop. Roger Penske is smiling right now. He is obviously very tense. You've got one more out there, Rod. Well, Bill, you had you know, a tough day with Mario dropping out, and Bobby evidently the ignition retarded on his mag, so it's a tough day, but Rick hanging in there. We'll have to see what happens at the end. Now, let me ask you this. Has he got enough fuel to go the distance? No, but we can uh, have a time stop at the end, and Rutherford's going to have to take on a full load of fuel, so we'll see what happens. Okay, back to you, Jim. Okay, that could be a factor in this race. That Rutherford has to take on a full load of fuel. We're back in Indianapolis. The yellow caution light is still on because of debris on the racetrack. And here at Indianapolis, the safety crews are the finest anywhere in the world. Well, Johnny Rutherford of Fort Worth, Texas, continues to lead. As a matter of fact, he has led a total of 83 laps in the 64th edition of the world's greatest race. Now, there are a lot of drivers who were less fortunate. We'll recap those that we told you about earlier, like Larry Cannon, Dick Ferguson, Bill Whittington. And the list started to grow after the 29th lap. Rookies were having their problems along with the veterans like Al Unser, Johnny Parsons, whose dad is driving the pace car today, and the rookie, Gordon Smiley. A little fire in the pits because of spilled fuel. Jim McElreath, Roger Rager, Jerry Carl, all out of the race, along with Mario Andretti and Dick Simon, who was the only driver thus far today that lost a wheel. And how he controlled it? Well, it was beautifully done, a veteran driver. Bobby Unser is out of the race. Both of the Unser boys are out now, and Bobby's problem was a mission coil on the 126th lap, and that's a tough break. Jerry Sneva is out because of a crash. Uh, reporting into the hospital, he is okay. Out at 130 laps, and the second foreign-born driver in the race, born in Australia, Dennis Firestone. Transmission problems, he's out at 137 laps. As we said, it's a beautiful day. And we talked a little earlier to John Cooper, who is the new president of Indianapolis Motor Speedway, a knowledgeable racing man who has come to Indianapolis many, many times, and he felt that this was a record crowd. And you must remember, there is permanent seating for 238,000 fans. And as we went around in the parade lap, well, there, I'm sure, were over 100,000 fans in the infield. And here's an opportunity to uh, give you a report on a persistent rumor that began a year ago that Mrs. Tony Hallman was anxious to sell the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The rumors were everywhere today, and the best way to find out is go right to the boss. And Mary Hallman is the boss, and she said it is not for sale. Definitely no. Well, let's go to the second turn now, because Dave Diles is there to file this interesting report from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. When you have more than 300,000 people trying to see a race that's contested on a two and a half mile oval, nobody really sees all the race. And the seat you have at home in front of your television set really is the best seat. Now, if the huddled masses are there in the infield, then the privileged few are here in the luxury suites, where you can see turns one and two and part of turn three. It's a very expensive seat, $10,000 for the second level, $20,000 leased by the year for the third level, and $40,000 here for the penthouse. Now, each suite accommodates about 40 people. In all, there are 26 of these suites, and they're leased generally to corporations. Now, a lot of people work just as hard to get an invitation here as people do to get a place to sit down in the infield. Uh, here, as we say, you can see three of the four turns. It is expensive, uh, but there is a long waiting list, 35 to 40 on the list, and there's over only one or two turnovers each year. 
Okay, Dave, thanks very much. But here comes the green, Johnny Russell with the leader, and look who's in second place, Gary Bettenhausen, who started next to last in the field. In fact, last Sunday, he was the so-called man on the bubble. Number 46 just went out of your picture. Uh, and in fact, if the rains had not come, he might have been bumped out of this field. But now he's come from next to last to second. Well, I'm very happy for him because it couldn't happen to a nicer man. He's worked hard in motor racing. That family have had tough breaks in motor racing and a lot of tragedy. And it's so nice to see him up this hard and this high in this particular race. Well, racing is very much a family affair in the United States. We noted that we had three sets of brothers starting in this race today, plus a set of half-brothers, Johnny Parsons and Pancho Carter. Uh, well, in the case of Gary Bettenhausen, his father, Tony, was one of the most popular and most skillful drivers in the history of Indianapolis, who met his death on this racetrack in practice one day, while testing a car for a friend, by the way. Well, if he's up there right now, and there's a pass right there, that, in fact, is, that's Rick Mears. Yep. Rick Mears getting back up there. He's the man who's really having a go now for the Roger Penske flag, and he's the only man left in the race car, racetrack to, to, to wave it. He's passed Tom Steven to move into fourth place. His next man in front is Gordon Johncock in car number 20. is the defending champion Rick Mears here he comes moving on John Cox can he get him this time yep yes sir he came out of the slipstream he came out of the draft and that's the way you have to do it because these race cars with this boost there's not a lot of power left there so you've got to be able to coax the car just at the right part of the racetrack to slingshot to get the benefit of aerodynamics the car in front is breaking the air and therefore allowing the car behind to get a lot of speed up he might improve his speed by oh six or ten miles an hour therefore allowing the pass to take place because there's nothing and look at this pass really low on the racetrack again that's the type of racing that is only relying on another driver making a slight error of judgment and someone else having the quickness of wit to take advantage of it is it possible jackie that the penske forces have been just saving that car a little bit in the heat today and are now letting out the boost a little more well i've never thought during the day of racing that rick mears has been driving as hard as he could and i think he's the man who sat back watched mary Landretti, watched bobby Unser attack where he's been sitting and waiting maybe that's what he is doing who knows okay well he's moving up right now Gary Bettenhausen in the black car number 46 there is Rick Mears who won this race at age 27 last year now back to try to repeat that hasn't happened very often the last time it happened was 1970 and 71 when Al Unser won two in a row in front of the well out of your picture now when Pancho Carter in car number 10 he'd be hitting. here comes another attempt at a pass he's going to do it progress is what you would expect from a man like Rick Mears. It looks that he's got a long future in motor racing, but that man there seems to have it nicely sewed up right now. He's got a fair advantage. That's Pancho Carter there. It seems likely that he's going to be penalized by one lap for possibly infringing a rule. But the man you're seeing right now is the man in the limelight, and look at the advantage that he's got in the rest of the field. That's Pancho Carter. Then you see the car of Rick Mears, the dark blue car number one and you see them coming onto this long 3,300 foot back stretch of this two and a half mile oval it's four corners it's turn ones and then a short shoot the short straight and then to turn two and down the long back stretch now again Pancho Carter would in fact be in second place in this race had he not been penalized the lap he would be just that much that you see on the racetrack behind Rutherford Rutherford with a six second lead right now going 188.3 seconds on his last lap unofficially that's the signal from his crew there you see the difference between them and there you see the leader going into turn one yet again but Rick Mears has done a tremendous job moving up from fifth to second in a very short period of time the job of catching Rutherford will be much more difficult it appears Jackie talked to Rick Mears a little bit earlier Rick it's been 12 short months since the sort of magic balloon went up for you has life changed a great deal for you well, not uh, not a great deal, no. It's uh, as far as the money is concerned. It's made me, you know, a little more comfortable and uh, my family a little more comfortable in our lifestyle. But uh, it's uh, I suppose the main thing has changed is it's made quite a few more demands on my time. I've uh, got a little less free time to myself, and you know we're a little busier than we used to be. And 
it's opened a few doors uh, business opportunity wise and that kind of thing I guess it's really kind of gotten the ball rolling so now it's just a matter of keeping it rolling in a remarkably short time you've done tremendously well in championship racing Rick it's now being suggested that you're going to go over to driving Grand Prix racing when's that likely to occur well it looks like possibly right now it'll probably be the French Grand Prix at the end of June uh, that'll be probably the first one we run um, I still uh, we're still kicking things around I haven't totally made up my mind as yet what I'm gonna do and uh, I'm gonna pro probably run the French Grand Prix and then after that make a total decision one way or the other on uh, actually what I want to do be fascinating to see how Rick Mears could do in Grand Prix racing in the history of that sport only two Americans have won the world title Phil Hill back in 1961 and Mario Andretti two years ago Rick Mears currently second trying to pursue Johnny Rutherford that is a very naughty problem to try to pick out for yourself today because Rutherford is just very very fast he is but nobody can give up and one never knows you know a motor car only needs to have a, a mild problem mechanically and this whole could change you could see the relationship it was a long way that he had an advantage Johnny Rutherford way out in front Johnny Rutherford continues to lead the Indianapolis 500 Mears second then Bettenhausen John Cock and Tom Sneva brother Jerry crashed a little bit earlier really hard to estimate how much money has gone into the preparation of this Johnny Rutherford car Jim Hall is uh, a financially secure man himself an oilman in Midland Texas he has testing facilities down there still needs additional car sponsors because it's an extremely expensive sport the way it's competed for uh, at this level this car as you can see just performs beautifully it's no accident it's a money sport let's see just how much is required what does a season of indy car racing cost that's a question often heard well it's like buying an airline ticket really you can go first class you can go tourist or you can take advantage of one of the many economy packages so to speak hopefully to fit your budget let's take a look at how a heavily financed and well-sponsored team like penske racing patrick racing or the chaparral team goes the first thing they need is a tractor and a trailer to carry the cars it's an air-conditioned tractor with radio and sleeper accommodations and the whole thing costs hundred and ten thousand dollars then in the back are two chassis at hundred thousand dollars four engines at thirty nine thousand dollars apiece spares and tools of fifty thousand dollars and we're up to four hundred and sixteen thousand dollars already then there's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar driver fee hundred and eighty thousand dollars for crew salaries and entry fees and our numbers hit seven hundred and forty six thousand then there are the logistics, airfares, uniforms, travel and promotional expenses, another $330,000. The numbers can vary a little bit up or a little bit down, but it's safe to say that a top-line team does spend more than a million dollars for a season of racing. Look at the other side of the coin, the unsponsored racer, the newcomer, the Roger Rager type. Well, when they come, they usually come in something like this. A covered trailer and something to pull it with cost about $8,000. And inside is a used chassis, cost $40,000. And instead of expensive racing engines, there's three stock block Chevrolet engines, cost $7,500 a piece. We asked about logistics, and we're told that a month's rent in an Indianapolis apartment is $500. Add another thousand to that for incidentals for the month of May, plus another 10,000 for the rest of the season, and you'll have a Roger Rager getting through the year for about $82,000. And what about the returns? Well, the returns come in two forms, sponsorship and prize money. For the haves, where it costs over a million dollars to go racing, they can expect a sponsorship to total a million or a million and a half dollars from a top American company. And they'll have a profit going in. For the have-nots, where their cost is just over $80,000, Roger Rager said the other day he's already gotten $67,500 in sponsorship money, and if he does well in the 500, he might pick up another 10 or 15,000 before the end of the year, and perhaps break even. And what about the winnings? Well, to win the Indianapolis 500 pays between a quarter of a million and $300,000. For top-ranked team, that's just an entry in the ledger. For Roger Rager, it's easy street. And Roger Rager, of course, unfortunately crashed and is out of this race. In this particular Indianapolis 500, still led by Johnny Rutherford, pursued by the defender, Rick Mears, and then Gordon Johncock, a former winner. Tom Steva, who started last in the race today, is still in fourth place at the moment, and Gary Bettenhausen, who started next to last, is just behind him now. So the two
two of them have been per pretty close to each other all afternoon, moving up all the way through the field. They have, and the top four, and there's Johnny Rutherford going to come in for fuel. This is the vital one for yep. him. He's going to have to top right up with fuel. Every gallon and every quart that he can get in there has to go in because he's still going to have a good many laps still to go, and it's even going to be marginal at the end of the race for him. And this fuel stop, nobody can make the slightest error of judgment because Rick Mears is hot on his heels and he doesn't have to make another pit stop so therefore things look very tight for Johnny Rutherford and optimistic if you like for the Rick Mears team. No question about it this race is not over not over at all although Rutherford looks comfortable and his car looks so smooth and beautiful here he comes in now for this all important critical pit stop as you said one drop wrench could lose the race here. Well the car itself needs 40 gallons of fuel right now they'll probably put change any rubber on him, they're going to try and send him out. Now he's already passed the fast pit stop that we've seen just for fuel. So therefore there's, they're really making sure, they're really putting every quark in. It's a long pit stop just for fuel. It certainly is. 17 seconds. That could be very costly. Stay with us. This race isn't over. Because Rick Mears is really pushing it out on the racetrack right now and is the leader at this moment. Rick Mears defending his championship leads at Indianapolis. After dogging the leaders all day, Rick Mears has taken the lead at Indianapolis. More coming up after this word from your local stations. Rick Mears leads the Indianapolis 500 as we enter the closing stages. Less than 30 laps to go in the race now. Smeva is second, as you notice, and Johnny Rutherford is third. Boy, we have a lot of racing yet to come. Let's go down for a report in the pits to Christy Konamaki. Well, leader Johnny Rutherford just took 17 and a half seconds to do nothing but take on fuel. That's a rather long fuel stop. They checked the tires and did not change any. Now, had they wanted to change tires, they could have without it costing them any 